Hello, everyone, and welcome to MSK Unknown Case Series, case number 42. Here we have an interesting frontal view of the right shoulder, and I'll give you a second to ponder as to what you think the findings are. And I want to pose this question. The question here is the resorption of bone is seen in which anatomic area or areas? Is it subchondral, subtendinous, endosteal, A and B, A and C, or all of the above? And I've purposely given you a lot of uh, choices because I want you guys to really nail down exactly what this is. So if we take a look here, we notice that there's resorption of bone along the distal clavicle. There's distal clavicular osteolysis, right? We can see that almost looks like a rat has eaten out a piece of that bone along the distal clavicle. This, of course, would be subchondral because this is at the level of a joint, right, of the acromioclavicular joint. But that's not where it ends, right? So there's actually resorption in other areas. So if you look here along the medial aspect of the humeral head at the glenohumeral joint, there's also an area of resorptive change, but this would also be subchondral. So we have two examples of subchondral resorption here. And then if we take a look here along the greater tuberosity, there's also a little bit of resorption here along the greater tuberosity. This is where tendons attach, like the rotator cuff tendons, like the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, anteres minor. So we have an example of subtendinous resorption here, right? So you know, we don't have any endosteal resorption. So the best answer here would be, of course, A and B with subchondral and subtendinous resorption. And we can see that where the arrows are, there's osseous resorption of bone. There actually might even be subligamentous resorption. If you take a look here along the undersurface of the clavicle, this is where the coracoclavicular ligaments run, right? Between the coracoid process of the scapula to the undersurface of the clavicle, right? The trapezoid and conoid components of the coracoclavicular ligaments insert right here. So there's actually even, you can argue, evidence of subligamentous, but that wasn't included in the uh, answer choice. So the best choice here would be A and B. And this is, of course, an example of hyperparathyroidism, right? Hyperparathyroidism is due to increased parathormone levels. There's a primary, secondary, and tertiary form. Of course, we all know that the primary form is related to most commonly a parathyroid adenoma, adenoma. And the secondary form is usually related to chronic kidney disease, right? You see it very commonly in chronic kidney disease. And really the hallmark finding in all forms of hyperparathyroidism, although clinically they can be different, is osseous resorption or resorption of bone. And that's what we're looking for, you know, radiographically or on CT or an MRI. You know, we're looking for those type of findings. And the osseous resorption can really be anything. It can be subperiosteal, subchondral, subligamentous, subtendinous, subphyseal. The list goes on and on, right? You know, very commonly on the board exam, they'll show you an example of subperiosteal resorption, typically along the radial aspect of the second and third middle phalanges of the hands. That's a very characteristic and textbook area of, you know, subperiosteal resorption in hyperparathyroidism. Of course, it can be subchondral, as I showed you, at the glenohumeral joint, a chromioclavicular joint. The pubic symphysis would have been another place that's very classic for subchondral resorption, subligamentous as I had shown you, you know, at the level of, you know, the coracoclavicular uh, ligaments, you know, on the undersurface of the clavicle, that's a very nice place. Subtendinous, you know, typically at the rotator cuff, greater tuberosity. Also, it could be along the trochanters, you know, where the gluteal tendons insert at the hip. It could be along the ischial tuberosities where, you know, the hamstring tendons are inserting. So, you know, a lot of ways to show hyperparathyroidism, but osseous resorption or loss of bone is the key finding in hyperparathyroidism. Typically, this is asymptomatic, but it can be found on laboratory tests. In primary hyperparathyroidism, you're going to have elevated serum levels, right? The phosphorus may be normal or decreased, but in secondary hyperparathyroidism, calcium levels are going to be low and serum phosphorus is going to be high, right? So um, always keep that in mind. And, you know, the classic mnemonic that they teach you in the USMLE is, you know, stones, bones, abdominal groans, psychiatric moans. It can have a lot of different, you know, presentations with like kidney stones, you know, bone pain, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and, you know, some psychiatric issues, you know, with, you know, changes in memory and stuff, et cetera. So nice example of hyperparathyroidism, an important metabolic bone disease. Always remember that the hallmark finding is osseous resorption. Thank you so much for your attention. Tune in next week for another super high yield MSK unknown case.